Raising Lazarus was the final public action of Jesus, at least according to the unknown anonymous author we call John in his theologically constructed narrative. So then, according to Johannine thought, the very last public thing Jesus did was restore life to a beloved friend. This final sign spoke volumes to the Johannine Jesus group, writing this document decades later. Consequently, the story granted to them an awareness about reversals, life springing up from the grave, joy of reunification emerging from the separation death brings. Now, when you know that ancient writers told stories as a means of getting across ideas, and they didn't tell stories to report to you the news of the day, again, it raises the question, how do we know what is historical and what is not? This is the bombshell. No other early Christian writing tells the story of the raising of Lazarus. Now, think about that, folks. If that actually occurred as a historical event, can you imagine that word wouldn't spread like wildfire? And so why is it not in any other gospel? Not only the four in the New Testament, it's nowhere else in early Christian writing. Maybe it's a theological creation, not a historical event. And again, we got to try to figure out how are we going to tell the difference? Read carefully John chapter 11, verse 2. Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was ill. See? It's as if the audience would respond, Oh yeah, Mary of Bethany, of course, we know her. But that's just it. We haven't yet reached the story where Mary gets to shine in chapter 12, verses 1 to 7. And notice how, just as with Mary, no introductions are provided for either her sister Martha or Lazarus. This indicates that the audience, the Johannine community, knows their stories already and knows them very well. You see, as with every other gospel story, what we're getting here is an updated telling of what is already, by the time of the composition of John, an old, familiar story. So many times, John presupposes that his audience is really familiar with the story of Jesus. Clearly, the document we call John was not written for outsiders who are unfamiliar with Jesus. Instead, like all the other New Testament documents, the Gospel was written for insiders well associated with the tradition. Consequently, any idea that this community would write out copies of John to hand them out to strangers on the street is a ludicrous Christian fantasy. But let's not talk about that right now. Instead, let's discuss Lazarus, who, after God and Jesus, is the single most important character in this gospel called John. Who is Lazarus? You see him all over the gospel called John. Let me show you. We are told by the fourth gospel in chapter 11, verse 3 to 5, that Lazarus is he whom Jesus loved. In the Bible, love means Mediterranean in-group glue attachment. To attach yourself to someone or something, that's love in the biblical sense. To call Lazarus the beloved disciple means to say that he is the one that Jesus was most attached to. He loved all these different disciples. He was stuck very close to them in this Mediterranean sense. But he was attached to no one so closely or so intensely as to the beloved disciple, to Lazarus. In this gospel called John, by people who lived decades after it was written and when its community had long since disintegrated, we see Lazarus mentioned repeatedly throughout the storyline. First, we see Lazarus as one of the first two disciples to follow Jesus. He isn't named at first, but the original intended audience for this document called John knew who it was. John the Baptist tells Lazarus and Andrew that Jesus is the Sky Vault Man, or the Lamb of God, in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 40. Later, after rescuing his beloved friend from death at his own funeral, which is the final public act of the Johannine Jesus, the Master Jesus places Lazarus in the most honored position at his farewell dinner in chapter 13, verses 23 to 25. 
Then, after the Johannine Jesus gets arrested and taken to the kangaroo court at the high priest's house at nighttime, look at how badass Lazarus is in chapter 18, verses 15 through 16. He's especially badass when you compare him to cowering Peter. Lazarus is the other disciple, the one identified with the disciple whom Jesus loved, who was stuck like glue to Jesus. In the context of the story, he's a member of the Judean elites. He's not a fisherman. He's living in the Jerusalem suburb of Bethany. So he gets to walk right into the high priest's house. Nothing bars his way. He already died, remember? He doesn't flinch at death. Lazarus already had his funeral. Lazarus is like the true shepherd. He stands his ground with death all around. He doesn't run. He leads sheep like Peter through the gate. And Peter is like the hireling who runs when trouble comes. Peter is the outsider. He stays outside and acts as an outsider by denying Jesus. What kind of shepherd is that? The beloved disciple Lazarus goes right into the hell with Jesus. See? Beloved disciple Lazarus is presented as a Mediterranean hyper-ethnomasculine badass like Jesus is presented. Good shepherds produce other good shepherds Good shamanic holy men produce other good shamanic holy men. Remember, inspiration happens in, folks. The most important part of the words inspiration and incarnation is the prefix in. In is messy, folks. Culturally specific messiness. Then later at the crucifixion, again we see this Mediterranean hypo-ethnomasculine badass Lazarus, the one whom Jesus stuck like glue to, through all the hell, standing firm with the badass Mediterranean women closest to Jesus, in chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Then at the empty tomb, we have the beloved disciple Lazarus outreaching Peter and steadfast in his Mediterranean loyalty while Peter's asking questions he could never get the answers to. And finally, we see Lazarus for the first time in the only place in the fourth gospel where the otherwise inferior disciple Peter actually shines, actually looks good, in chapter 21. This is where the conversation about Lazarus' dying again and being buried again takes place. Very interesting. So, who was this Lazarus, this beloved disciple? Likely, he was born after the death and resurrection of Jesus probably to second wave Jesus group people, maybe originally from Bethany, escaping the Judean wars that destroyed the countryside. He met the risen Jesus in many alternate states of consciousness experiences. He never knew Jesus while he was alive during his ministry. He met the Sky Vault Man Jesus. He was guided by the risen Jesus. Maybe he came close to death at some point in his life and was saved by the risen Jesus and healed. Who knows? Originally, his Jesus group was like every other Jesus group, having an active evangelization to other Israelites, preaching theocracy, the kingdom of God, coming soon. But by the mid-80s of the first century, that all changed. His Jesus group turned inward abandoned caring about the imminent kingdom of God, the theocracy. They couldn't care about theocracy anymore. The Sky Vault Man kept descending in their midst, in their trance states, at their meetings, more frequently than all other Jesus groups we know of experienced. Something horrible happened to this group of misfits, and they got angry, very angry, very hurt. They became an anti-society with their own anti-language. We know this because of the document that survived them, the fourth gospel we call John. Eventually, when the beloved disciple died, their community disintegrated into multiple Johannine Jesus groups. We know this from the gospel, the letters called 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, where we see Johannine successionists, and chapter 21 of the fourth gospel. Folks, when the anti-language of this gospel found its way into second century Jesus groups unfamiliar with how the now extinct anti-society perceived and understood things, they recontextualized this strange writing 
taking it as a storehouse of new information about Jesus and God. Someone, somewhere, eventually attributed its authorship to an illiterate fisherman named John, who was one of Jesus' innermost followers. But by then, St. John was much more than an illiterate fisherman. He had evolved into a theologian, providing a cornucopia of new information about God the Son, Jesus. Thank you.